Hello, and welcome to Dark Pennine Tales. Today, I'll be reading a story by Samuel Minier. It's called Falling Stars. Meteors. That's what I thought. Hoped for. Solitary fireballs arcing the night. But these soared too low, too close to home. And when one crashed through my bedroom window, shattered glass like a rattle cage, three burn mark skips across the area rug before plunking against the baseboard and rolling back, the sinewy twine snapping and the leather casing cracking apart so that the rubber-encrusted cork core crumbled out like a rotted walnut from its shell. Then I had to face what it was, a charred baseball, and I knew she was back. I stamped out the ball, ruined my slipper, left a suit trail as I plodded downstairs. Through the screen door, I could see her small form far out in the yard, almost to the tree line. I pulled on boots, but no coat, bathrobe instead, to show I wasn't staying outside long. Snow like fine sand, easily sifted on the surface, but hard packed beneath. Cold for me, but far too cold for her, in her cut-offs and thin white Troy's Hardware Summer League t-shirt from 1963. She'd fired three more into the sky by the time I reached her. They never came down to fizzle out in the white field, just kept streaking smaller and smaller until they looked as distant as all the other pinpoints of light. Angela. I tried to sound like the adult I was, not her best friend. You can't keep doing this. She smiled, peachy cheeks, barely pink lips. I remembered melting crayons with her, everything but pink. She'd always hated pink. On her parents' living room radiator when we were in second grade. You wouldn't come out, she said. Three nights of this, against all logic, the fear was starting to wane. Well, I'm out here now. Thanks. Blur of the bat. Crack like lightning. Another shooting star. Why now? I asked. You forgot my birthday. She was right. Forty years would do that. No, I didn't. I stalled as my memory chugged. It was January, January 12th, she said, three days ago. The wind grabbed at my robe, prickled my stomach flesh. She began drawing nonsense lines in the snow with the tip of the bat. What does 50 feel like? Old when I look at you. Why are you here, Angie? I want to show you something. If she wanted vengeance, there was little I could do. Whatever this was, though, it couldn't possibly help. No sense in picking at scabs. No, I said. A fireball rocketed through my car, taking out the windshield. You have to see! She tantrumed. Another small explosion against my house. Smoke and charred siding. I'll burn it all down if you make me. I held up both hands in surrender. She won't hurt you. She won't hurt you. Are we going somewhere? She nodded tightly, eyes drawn down, suddenly bashful. 
I missed her terribly at that moment, maybe more than I'd ever let myself. I need a coat, I choked out. I'm cold. She grabbed my hand, just like her, to defy stereotypes. She was burning up. Her fingertips scorched tiny ridges into my palms. Better, she asked. She led me across the field. I kept my eyes down, watching the snow powder her ankles and then rapidly evaporate. She was aflame in the darkness, her movements flickering. I tried to hesitate when we entered the thicket, afraid the trees would erupt into fiery pillars, but her grip was unquestionable. Not strong, just inescapable. The moon carved swathes of light through the woods. She dragged the bat in the snow with her free hand, tracing a path, a string through the labyrinth. Indeed, the trees had quintupled into a no-walled maze, but she just kept towing me through innumerable right angles of faded birch, effervescent pine. The house that shouldn't be here, that had been two hundred miles from here on the day she died, that house was in the next clearing, like a boxy shadow against the silver glow of the snow so that any hint of trim or definition slipped away. It remained shapeless, hulking. I forced myself not to cower. That house was far from here, back in the town of my childhood, if it still existed at all. Probably had been levelled years ago. That's all this was. A ghost, just like her. Let the memories parade and be done with it. She handed me my old bat. Handle still duct taped for grip. Sweet spot still worn to a fine grain. I balled my hands, trying to resist. Please, just leave me on the bench. I'm only here to watch. But she curled my fingers back without pressure, like peeling an onion or opening a secret. You were the only boy who could hit farther than me, she said with a preteen flirtation. That's why I followed you after practice that day, because you were better than me. Different. I was different. She was a creature unheard of. A girl who could name all the Yankees and who never cried, even when Tommy Stamos tripped her in practice and she bit clean through her lip. I'd been so nervous that day, couldn't stop chattering. She'd stoically listened as I buzzed in circular logic over and over why our team had the championship in the bag. I only managed to silence myself by chasing the words away with the bat, a toss and a swing every couple hundred feet, imaginary grand slams guiding us across old man McNamara's backfield until that very last one. She lofted a ball before me. I swung immediately, on instinct, as if I'd been waiting forty years to play this out again. Everything just like when we were kids. A crushing connection, the ball rocketing farther than ever before, but foul, far foul. The ball punched a pupil through one of the house's dull, vacant eyes. I wouldn't give you the chance to go in. Her voice floated next to my ear. When I turned, though, I found only tiny shoe tracks that peeled away from me and led to the house's front door. I was as tough as you, the voice continued, not scared of getting in trouble, trespassing, some bogeyman. You knew that, right? I knew. She'd just been faster than me, that's all. It just as easily could have been me, picking my way up the rotted stairs peeking through the ragged refuse of the bedrooms until spotting the ball. 
standing amid the broken glass and calling down into the field, teasing, never hearing the closet door slowly ease open. You could have yelled, screamed, waved your arms. She was in the house, her face again peering through the blasted hole of window. You saw him coming. Why didn't you tell me? Not raging or even hurt. Those would have been easier. Just curious, eternally wondering. I didn't have an answer, even as I watched it happen again. The bearish figure padding behind her, seeming to swell with each step. A good five, ten seconds. Seconds like years, more than enough time to save her, or at least try. I didn't. Throat of stone, rooted feet. He lifted a roughly severed table leg, a savage's club, a bat of his own. She never looked back, eyes still on mine, when they burst glistening constellations against the remains of the glass pane. As before, I fled, stumbling through the snow and back into the thicket, soon lost amid trees and memories. They had found Angie, congealing in the summer heat, but nothing else. People came forward with sightings of staring strangers, always unclean, often black. A drifter, the police speculated, some wandering monster. The town grieved, spoke of cruel and meaningless loss, then moved on. It was the sixties. Soon there was blood everywhere. I never came forward. By the time I got home, I had screamed myself hoarse. Over Angie or my inaction? Mom reasoned my croaked voice and shaking as signs of a summer cold. I went to bed with the sun still up, and days later I gave a fine performance for my parents, as if I was just learning that Angie was gone. Winter branches whipped my face. Just get back home. Get back home. And just like that, the wish was granted. I cleared the woods. No tracks in the snow but mine. No shattered windshield. No scorched siding. My bedroom window, unbroken. Unbroken, but occupied. His bulk filled the entire pane. Face still as undefined as the McNamara house. But I had no trouble distinguishing my old bat. Snug in his swollen southpaw, a gentle patient tapping against the glass, waiting. That's why I came back, she said. She was nowhere. When I looked to the sky, though, I could make out two globes of light brighter than the others, like eyes, or maybe just two of her baseballs, caught in binary orbit, now forever linked. I just wanted to tell you not to be afraid. It doesn't hurt when he takes you, just like the cartoons. Stars. All you'll see is stars. You've been listening to Falling Stars by Samuel Minier. Read by Angela Blythe. Thank you, and until next time on Dark Pennine Tales.